Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by Danish Sound Cluster. We are talking about hearing loss and dementia today. And uh, bear with us. Uh, we are just one minute over time here. We had some technical difficulties, but we should be all set now to go. Um, my name is Jeppe Linnegaard. I am the event and project manager here at Danish Sound Cluster. I have a background in sound design and uh, music production, mm -hmm. but today I am the moderator of this webinar uh, hosted by Danish Sound Cluster. And for those of you who don't know us, I would just like to uh, introduce you to uh, the uh, Danish Sound Cluster. You can follow us on YouTube, where all of our webinars will be uh, recorded and published. And you can also follow us on uh, LinkedIn for more uh, tips about events and webinars like this one. Now, uh, we have a very big uh, event conference coming up here November 5th. I'd just like to uh, share with you. We're talking about sound and acoustics. We are at the Royal Danish Academy of Architecture and Design, and we've got a lot of interesting profiles in the program. We just added today Julian Treasure, who's a five-time TED Talker, and um, Nigel Osland has also recently been added, as well as has Valentina from Oticon. And um, you can see the full program on our website. It's going to be a lot of inspiration, a lot of networking, and a good place to meet your colleagues in the sound uh, community. So uh, check that out and uh, hope to see you there. Now, for today's webinar, I'd just like to share with you that uh, we've got uh, all kinds of uh, profiles in the audience today. We really appreciate you joining this interesting topic, and it looks like that you are in the in the right place um, uh, from the looks of your profile. So thank you so much for showing up, everybody. Now, in the panel today, we have Jesper Bess Smith, Manuela Cantuaria, and Søren Ries. And um, I would like to just uh, make a short introduction of the today's three speakers. We have Jesper Bess Smith, who's the professor and senior consultant at SDU. He has earned his medical degree from the University of Southern Denmark in 2002 and later became specialist in ear, nose, throat diseases in 2013. Since then, Jesper has been employed at the Ear, Nose, Throat Hearing Clinic at Odense University Hospital, where he's a senior physician and chief consultant. Jesper is also an SDU associate professor teaching about hearing and balance diseases. Jesper has a PhD in hearing loss and hearing problems among symphony orchestra musicians in Denmark. And he was instrumental in starting the Clinic for Musicians Health at Odense University Hospital for Professional Musicians. I say hello to uh, Jesper. Do you want to just say hello to the audience? Yes, hello. Hello. Thank you, Jesper, for joining us today. We also have Manuela Cantuaria, assistant professor at SDU and also affiliate researcher at Danish Cancer Institute. With over 10 years of experience in epidemiology, Manuela is a leading investigator in a study of the link between hearing loss and dementia conducted in the region of southern Denmark. Her research utilizes a comprehensive cohort encompassing all older adults living in this region leveraging Denmark's extensive register and clinical data, which you will be talking more about in this uh, webinar today. Manuela, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, yes, and hello to everyone. <laughs> and finally, we have Søren Ries, Vice President at Cochlear. Søren Ries holds a PhD in Automatic Speech Recognition from DTU and has 20 plus years of experience managing hearing solution product development and research in companies like Nokia, Oticon, Oticon Medical, and recently Australian-based Cochlear. Throughout his career, Søren has focused extensively on collaboration between industry and academics in the hearing science space, and in particular in the area of cognitive hearing science for users of both traditional hearing aids and cochlear implants. So, Søren, I couldn't see a better fit for uh, today's webinar with uh, Jesper and Manuela. So thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you for having me. For sure. Uh, okay, just before I will leave the floor to uh, Jesper, I would like to just mm, ask you that um, it seems like the correlation between dementia and hearing um, seems to be kind of a, a hot topic. We've seen shows on national TV, Denmark's radio, news in the media, podcasts, and, and so on. Why do you think this has suddenly caught such interest? Asking You're all asking us or the that's audience? A, that's a, sorry, that's a, that's a question for Jesper. Sorry if you missed that. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think, uh, of course, dementia is a, it's a major, major public health concern for, uh, for, for societies, uh, and especially also a society like, uh, like in Denmark and, uh, and, and, and internationally, because it's, uh, it's, it will affect a lot of people, and uh, we have a lot of people also affected by, he by hearing loss. So actually, we have two, uh, uh, two major diseases, so to say. And uh, of course, if there's a link, bet link between them, it's of course something that would be very, very relevant uh, for, for, for the society in, in, in general. So, so I think uh, that uh, that's, that's also why uh, this has uh, attracted uh, so much attention. And of course, especially if, 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 uh, if, it, if it will help uh, alleviating hearing loss, uh, uh, also if you can uh, postpone, delay, the onset of, of, of dementia, even prevent dementia, it's of course a, a very interesting perspective. Yes, thank you so much. And I hope to be a lot wiser after today's webinar about this. And um, Manuela, for someone like me, who's not that deep into research, uh, can you maybe paint a picture uh, of some of the research that's been done prior to your study here? Yes, uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about about that in the in the presentation. But I think just to summarize, most of the most of the studies they do uh, show a link. Uh, yeah, I would say a clear link between hearing loss and dementia. But uh, what is important to say here is that the the study design and the like how hearing loss is assessed, how dementia is assessed, and also like the number of people included and how representative that is, this varies a lot between studies. So uh, one of the questions here is also whether the risk estimates that have been shown previously, are they really um, yeah, revealing what's happening or can it be due to other factors? So this is something to be discussed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's constantly evolving. Yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, Manuela. And uh, finally, Jesper, do you see any of this interest um, among users as well of hearing aids? Or is it mostly at this point at research and industry level in regards to dementia? Jesper? Oh, oh, sorry, that's uh, for Sean. I think so. Oh, for Sean. Sean, yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I say yes? But I'm sorry. Yeah, you said my name, but I'm uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I meant you, Sam. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Can you please repeat the question? Yes, so of course. I... So, so um, as we've mentioned here, there seems to be a, a lot of interest in uh, dementia and um, uh, in research and, and so on. But do you see uh, a similar interest among the users? Uh, is there is there a, you know is there a, a, an awareness going on among the users? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the users are, of course, aware that, uh, I mean, I think we are, we're starting to, to understand this uh, link between hearing and cognition uh, more and more. And I think uh, users are, of course, interested if, if a hearing loss has some sort of correlation with dementia, they would definitely like to, to, to do something about it. So I think the awareness is, is increasing. Uh, but I, I think uh, a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, work is still needed, also both from from research, but also from the industry and providing solutions that can help people, uh, you know, here with the devices uh, throughout the day. Because part of part of the correlation to to dementia is also uh, this thing about social isolation, which we know is a is a a thing you have when you have a hearing loss. And the, the more severe your hearing loss is, the, the the more isolation and and less social interaction you have, which is is also a a risk factor for dementia, right? Right. Uh, 
So this is uh, something that we will uh, come back to in the Q&A session when uh, Jesper, Manuela and Saran have done the, the short presentations. For those of you... You who've joined us late today, to you, uh, Jesper and Manuela, you can um, you can uh, share your screen. Yes. So I start sharing. Um, if I can. Uh, Is it me who is going to start? Sharing? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you you start sharing. Sorry. Yeah, you start sharing. And then, <laughs> fine, okay. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. So that's just the introduction, and then we if you put on 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 the next slide. Yeah, that's fine. So, what we're going what we're going to look at here today, I just see if I can. Uh, I don't know if I can use my pointer on it. That's I think that's probably the the problem here. But uh, I, I think it, it will work anyway. Okay, uh, we're going to to look in, in, into today whether we can actually link uh, link, link hearing hearing laws uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 to, dement to dementia, uh, but. The big, the big problem here is whether hearing loss is actually uh, is is actually uh, related to 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 this uh, cognitive and and, and phys physical functioning. So so we we need to understand here is there a common cause or is this a modified risk factor? I put here a, a question mark between hearing loss and the cognitive and, and physical functioning, and that's that's why it's it's because the hearing loss as such uh, may be able to to actually. Uh, change some uh, so, some uh, some structures. I think it's better if I take over the 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 the, the sharing manual because I think it's it works better for me with the, with okay. these uh, models. Can can we try that? So I, I just try to uh, to do it like this because then I can better uh, make it to work. I think. So I think I am now sharing and then I put it on presenter mode. Is that would work? Yes, and can you put it on full screen, perhaps? Yeah, I, I, I will do that. I'm yes. just trying to do that. Perfect. Now it should be in full screen. Yes, perfect. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's that's fine. So so we then I can also take it to show you my point, and it would be easy for you to see. Do it like that. Yes, this is better. So we need to understand here if there's an underlying common cause or if this is actually a, a, mod a modified risk factor. So the underlying cause here, what could that be? That could be aging, for instance. So we, we, we do not actually know whether actually aging is the underlying cause here. So aging could actually be, be relevant uh, both in terms of, of, uh, of, of leading to hearing loss, as, as we all know that the hearing loss will increase with age. But, but aging will probably also affect our our cognitive well-being and our physical functioning so this is about how our brain brains actually work what works here so the big question here is actually whether whether hearing loss as such does it actually have any influence on what is going on in the brain how our brain our brains will, will work in in terms of cognitive function and also the, the the physical function so we could also say that to to have healthy aging we, we all want to have as perfect health as 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 possible uh, for for our for our our late uh, our, our late years and this also means that we will be cognitively well functioning and we will have a, a well uh, functioning uh, uh, physics of a, of our body so if we, if we are uh, uh, looking into to, to hearing loss here, could it actually affect brain structure and function? Some studies are actually pointing to, towards that. And, and, and uh, because if we, we know if, if we have a hearing loss, then we will lose some areas of our brain. I will come back a little bit to that. And this is, could, of course, be, be, uh, be related to, uh, to, to how the brain works uh, as overall. What about if, if, if we actually try to... Uh, uh, to, to, to stimulate our hearing, will that actually lead to cognitive stimulation? It will, and this can actually also uh, have, have the ability to, 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 uh, uh, to, to lead to how our, our brain actually can, uh, can, can function here. And then uh, hearing loss is also associated to, to social isol isolation, and social isolation is uh, also a, a risk factor for, uh, for, for, for dementia. So being a social active person will also lead to, uh, to to a better uh, cognitive function so this is also about 
uh, how to to stimulate the brain uh, in in an optimal in an optimal way. If we are uh, going into more of these uh, hypotheses here uh, that uh, that that people are actually uh, work working on to understand uh, this uh, link. So the whole idea is: is this a causal link? So will hearing loss actually lead to uh, uh, lead to uh, to dementia or? Uh, is it the is is is, is there something uh, another cause maybe aging that uh, leads to both uh, hearing loss uh, and 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 dementia? It could be that these hypotheses here all actually uh, could be uh, could be valid here. It could be that we have a a person with cognitive decline, so uh, the cognitive function will decrease o over time. And does this lead to uh, to hearing loss measured with audiometry? This would actually, if this is the case, it would be that. That uh, that actually dementia or cognitive decline would actually precede uh, precede hearing loss. So if, if this is the case, then we will probably not have this uh, uh, causal link between the hearing loss and dementia. On, on the other hand, if we uh, look at the other way around, is if you have the hearing loss coming first, and then uh, this uh, leads to the hypothesis that we call the information degradation hypothesis here. So this could actually lead to lead to to compromise cognitive performance. So you are not getting the, enough information via your hearing hearing sense, and then uh, this actually affects how your brain will actually uh, process uh, the, uh, the the information from the from, from, from the hearing system. And on the other hand, here. Uh, this is one of the hypotheses that I um, probably believe more in uh, personally myself is that we have a hearing loss here. Then this leads to uh, what we call sensory deprivation. So actually you get less input to your brain, it's auditory system, and this uh, the brain needs this information so it actually can lead to uh, to, to, to cognitive decline uh, per se. Or this, uh, the, the last one here in D is actually you have the third factor hypothesis leading both to hearing loss and cognitive decline. This could, for instance, be aging, as I as, as I pointed out uh, before. Putting on uh, on some uh, some mechanisms here and on, on just some uh, brain slides here could I actually be this is more linked to to dementia uh, in, its, in itself. For instance, uh, Alzheimer Alzheimer's disease. So that's why it's called uh, Alzheimer's pathology. So it could be that there are some unknown facts of, for instance, Alzheimer's disease that actually could affect the, the primary auditory cortex, which we have here. So actually we have a, 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 another, uh, another disease actually leading to the hearing loss, but also affecting other uh, areas uh, areas of, of 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 the brain. This this could this this could be uh, this could be uh, be valid, but it will also at the same time requires that that the dementia would actually precede uh, precede hearing loss. If we are thinking about if hearing loss is preceding dementia, then we could look at this uh, hypothesis here uh, showing the impoverished input. So this means that you have a hearing loss here leading to to impoverished auditory input. So the brain will actually receive less information from the auditory system, which could lead to, to shrink rate catch here of, of the primary audit, auditory cortex. So this is actually something that could be, be relevant to look at saying, okay, we have a shrink rate here of, of some, some parts of the brain and could this in, uh, per se uh, uh, leads to, 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 to maybe a further cognitive decline and then possibly dementia. The, 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 the third mechanism here is, is also very interesting in terms of, of linking hearing loss and dementia. Again, we have here an impoverished input, but at the same time, when this happens, and, and many people with hearing loss can actually uh, tell us a lot about this, then you will have this uh, state of increased listening effort. So they are really struggling in understanding speech and background noise, for instance. And this struggling would actually put on more stress for the brain. And this has also been uh, there has also been some uh, uh, some discussions going on whether this stress actually is 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 a poor thing for the brain. So this could actually leave uh, leave you to uh, to uh, in a state where 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 where, where, where cognitive decline or, or occurs because you you simply uh, you you're simply filled up with too much information in the brain and your brain capacity is not. Uh, is not uh, big enough, uh, so to say, to actually handle this inf information. So actually, this could be some kind of a vicious circle uh, going on here. So when you have the hearing loss, then you have too much listening effort uh, going on here, trying to cope with uh, with the hearing loss. And maybe this is a risk factor 
uh, leading uh, to, to cognitive decline because you have an occupation of these uh, cognitive uh, resources. I think I will leave it. I, I, I will uh, I will leave it here because uh, these uh, three uh, mechanisms here are, 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 are the, the the most uh, uh, common ones to to to, to discuss. And then uh, we uh, move on to you, Manuela, and I can stop sharing. Okay, thanks, Jesper. I'll just... Okay, so I'll just continue. Thanks for the for explaining all these, all the potential mechanisms. And now um, I think it's relevant that we dig into the, the existing literature uh, focusing on the epidemiological evidence uh, yeah, that exists. Uh, so one of the first studies that has uh, analyzed the link between dementia and hearing loss was done in 1989 uh, by Oman and others. Um, and basically what they did was uh, yeah, a quite simple approach where they selected 100 persons with dementia and 100 persons without dementia. And then basically they assessed... Um, Yes, how many of these people uh, had a hearing loss? And by comparing the prevalence among the, the cases and controls, they saw that those with uh, dementia had twice the odds of hearing loss than those without dementia. So uh, this study had a quite simple approach, as, uh, as you can see, and it's not really sophisticated in terms of uh, epidemiology, but um, it was definitely an important finding um, yeah, and that actually pointed out for the need of future research within the field. However, even though they, there was this very interesting result for the time, uh, there, were, there, was, uh, there were many years uh, that we actually basically had no study on hearing loss and dementia. And this is probably due to a lack of interaction between the disciplines. So there was, uh, there was not a lot of interaction between the ones working with hearing, so audiologists, ENTs, and so on, and the ones focused on cognition and neurology, for instance. Uh, this has changed, however, within time. And from more or less 2010, there have been a lot of studies on the topic. Uh, so here I just put some examples of studies. We're not going into details to them uh, now. But what is important to discuss a little bit is about the study design that I had previously mentioned before. So most of the studies, um, yeah, at least the first studies within the field, they were, do, they were done cross-sectionally. And this means that basically data on hearing loss and dementia, they were collected at one specific point in time which, uh, yes, yeah, as it was in the, the example with Omen uh, study that I just mentioned to you. So this, of course, it's something valid. However, it's very important to remember when we talk about cross-sectional studies that we don't have, we cannot draw any conclusions in relation to temporality. Uh, so because we cannot know if hearing loss has anticipated dementia or or if that happened uh, in the other way around. Uh, this also uh, hinders any conclusion on causality, whether hearing loss actually lead to dementia or not. That's why most of the studies being conducted nowadays, they are actually conducted longitudinally. This means that data is collected repeatedly over time, and with that, we're then able to have a, a better picture whether hearing loss happens before or after, um, and whether yeah, hearing loss can lead to dementia. Uh, one of the limitations in some of the studies uh, that we can find now is that many of them, they, they are based on a considerably small sample size. And uh, many times from a volunteer cohort, which is not representative from the entire population. Also, if we look at the study, sometimes it's a little bit hard to compare because there's a great diversity in terms of hearing loss definition or how dementia is evaluated. But all in all, what we can see from most studies 
is that they do find a positive association between hearing loss and cognitive impairment and dementia. And what we can also see in most of the studies is that there is a dose response relationship, meaning that the risk for dementia will increase the more severe the hearing loss is. So just to give you some numbers, there's a recent meta-analysis that was done this year where they basically collect most of the evidence for longitudinal studies on dementia and hearing loss. And they saw that there is an association um, if we talk about hearing loss, having a hearing loss or not having a hearing loss. Uh, it is associated with, any, with, uh, with dementia risk. So by pulling together the results from previous studies, they found that having a hearing loss would increase the risk for having dementia in 35%. And uh, they also assessed two studies who have um, yeah, worked with hearing loss as a continuous variable. And for those two studies, they concluded that a 10 dB hearing loss, increase in hearing loss will lead to a 16% higher risk of dementia. We can see, however, that the results within this, this field are constantly evolving. And, uh, and every time there's like new results that may reshape our understanding within the topic. So just to illustrate this a bit, um, I have here uh, on the left, um, a figure from the Lancet Commission report on dementia prevention from 2020. And, uh, and we can see that in this report, hearing loss was by far the most significant modifiable risk factor for dementia, uh, with a proportion explaining dementia uh, yeah, cases in 8%. And after a few years, uh, so now this year, the Lancet Commission report has released a new one where uh, other studies have been taken into account, and we still have hearing loss pretty, um, yeah, pretty much in the top rank. However, we can see that it's not uh, on the top alone, uh, and it does explain a little bit less, so seven percent of, uh, yeah, the attributable, uh, yeah, the attribute attributable fraction to explain dementia cases out of different modifiable risk factors. Um, so this shows how it actually, it's not something that is written in stones and why it's relevant to conduct research on the topic. Um, another thing that it has been pointed out in this very extensive report, but also in different studies, is that uh, the research that uh, that also specifically assess the benefits of hearing loss treatment, such as hearing aids or cochlear implants, is still limited. We have uh, research, and we're, um, I know Jesper and I think John, they will also present some of those. Uh, but yeah, it's still, the results are still not so consistent. So that is why uh, we decided to conduct a study in the region of Southern Denmark as well, where we address uh, the associations between hearing loss and incident dementia. And we also evaluate how hearing aids can contribute to these associations. So if you want to read more about our paper, uh, we had a paper published this year. So you just, yeah can find it here if you want to read more or you can contact us as well. Um, but to explain you a little bit what has been done in our study in the region of Southern Denmark, um, the, the idea that we, that we had was to establish a very large cohort that was uh, re representative of the entire population. Uh, so basically we included all older adults that were 50 years old or older uh, living in the region of Southern Denmark, which is um, yeah shown here in, in red in the figure. Um, and by using the CPR number, which uh, I think if the most of the audience is from Denmark, for sure you know what we're talking about. It's basically a, a personal registration number in Denmark that will be used for everything and all the services that you use here. So by using the CPR number, we're actually able to gather data uh, from clinical journals 
So here we use data from audiometric, um, yeah, from from audiometric uh, examinations done in the public hearing rehabilitation clinics in in the region south. With the CPR number, we're also able to go back to registries and identify dementia cases by looking both at the patient registry and also for prescriptions for anti-dementia drugs. We're also able to gather data from a statistics Denmark where we can get data from socioeconomic status. Also, we're able to gather data from cardiometabolic comorbidities from other health registries. And Lastly, we're also able to find information of all persons who have requested a subsidy for hearing aids or also subsidized hearing aid batteries. So by combining all this data, we have then conducted our study, which is uh, was done uh, as a longitudinal study, a uh, cohort study, where basically we have our entire population and we follow them within time. So by following them within time, we then observe, uh, like, see whether they got any dementia diagnosis and when. And we are also able to assess hearing loss by looking at the, yeah, at the, at the clinical data and evaluating hearing loss. So for those that did not have an, audio, an, an audiometry, uh, we just consider them to not have a hearing loss. So in our study, hearing loss was assessed in three different ways. So first using the, the PTA average, so it's an average for four different uh, frequencies. So the higher the PTA, the higher the hearing loss. We also assess hearing loss as a binary variable, so having hearing loss, yes or no, and also assessed as uh, di three different uh, severities of hearing loss, so mild, moderate, and severe. So uh, we then assess associations between hearing loss and dementia, and we calculated something that is called an, a hazard ratio, uh, which is basically a measure indicating if there's an association or not. And we have adjusted that for demographic factors such as age and sex, and also socioeconomic status like occupation, uh, income, and education. And also we looked into cardiomet we also adjusted for cardiometabolic diseases such as diabetes and yeah, heart failure, etc. So here I show you some of the results. Um, uh, but here we can see first a result where we see we can uh, we can see that there is a positive association between hearing loss and risk for dementia. But um, we found that having a hearing loss increases the risk for dementia in 7%. Uh, what yeah, is marked over here. We also did the analysis for different severity degree, severity levels. Uh, and here we can see that uh, we find the stronger associations with sever severe hearing loss. Uh, so we can see that a severe hearing loss would lead to a 20% higher risk of dementia. And, um, and finally, if we just look at the results that we find and if we compare to previous studies, we actually do not find such strong associations as, as shown in some of the studies, for, for instance, the one cited by the Lancet report. Um, here I have uh, something that is called a, an exposure response association. So basically we can see how the risk for dementia varies for different uh, measure, values of uh, PTA, of the pure tone average measured at the better year. year. And uh, we can see by looking at this curve that hearing loss uh, was associated with an increased risk for dementia. But if we look at the shape of the curve, we can actually see that this happens from more or less 45 decibels of hearing loss. We cannot see that um, for hearing loss um, that is uh, less severe than that. And uh, just uh, a less, uh, the last result that I will show you uh, that will make a link to the to the previous uh, to the to the next slides uh, that Jesper will show. Uh, here we have the results that we found uh, where we used uh, to analyze whether he a hearing aid 
could decrease uh, the risk for dementia. And what we did here was to compare uh, the association between hearing loss, but for those that have not used a hearing aids compared to those that do not have a hearing loss, uh, and also those that have a hearing loss but are hearing aid users. So what the result shows here is that uh, if we compare with people without hearing loss, people with hearing loss who did not use hearing aids, they were at a considerably higher risk of dementia than people with hearing loss who used hearing aids. Uh, so yeah, the association was, uh, yeah. So 20% higher risk of dementia for those that do not use a hearing aids compared to a 6% uh, higher risk of dementia. So this result indicates that hearing aids might, might prevent or delay the onset and progression of dementia. Uh, but yeah, this is a, of course, this needs to be, uh, yeah, we need many other studies to be sure on that. So I'll leave the floor to Jesper again. Yeah. And I stop sharing. Yes, thank you very much, Manuela. And uh, Jesper, the, the floor is all yours. And you're muted, Jesper. <laughs> so now I think you can hear me. Uh, yes, thank you. I have a few, a few more a few more slides to end up this because uh, now uh, taking over from uh, where Manuela, Manuela ended about, uh, uh, about this uh, link between uh, hearing loss dementia and how uh, hearing aids uh, potentially actually, if you use them and you have a, a hearing loss, uh, actually could uh, could reduce uh, the risk uh, for, for, for dementia. Um, so the study Manuela presented uh, has, has, uh, is looking at, at the, you can say, a crude uh, dementia diagnosis. So that is where uh, the diagnosis of dementia is actually established. Many other studies are actually looking on the way towards uh, Dementia. So, in the period before, uh, when dementia is actually is actually diagnosed, this is a period where we call uh, we call it cognitive decline. This study here is a French it's a French study uh, that 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 was uh, conducted over twenty five years, and the, and the strength about this study is that they have actually uh, measured uh, the cognition for 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 many subjects. Uh, it has not so many data on hearing loss. They only uh, it's only some questions uh, uh, asking them whether they actually know that they got a hearing loss or whether they actually use hearing aids. The interesting part here is that you can see that there's actually three more or less parallel lines. It, it, it goes over over 25 years. Sorry, I just have to put the point on again here. Uh, here we go. So you can see it followed them for 25 years and you can see a, a steady decline in cognition, which is measured here. This is done with a a scoring system called the mini mental state examination. And this is some that is very well known for family doctors that are often using this uh, scoring system. So when you get uh, further down uh, this uh, uh, scale here, then you will get to a state uh, where we actually will say, okay, now it, it is dementia, but 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 on, uh, b before you enter that state, it's, it's what we call mild cognitive impairment. So what you can see here is that there will be a cognitive decline over time. And the, 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 the interesting part here is that, that if you can, uh, can look at it, uh, I have to see if it can uh, what does it make it? Oh, sorry about that. Here we go. Okay, then it, it should have pointed to, towards uh, the, 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 the upper line here. There's some uh, mistakes here in the slide, but it, it, it is people without, uh, with, without hearing loss. And uh, uh, people uh, with hearing loss not not treated with hearing aids. This would actually be the lower line. So there's some mix mixed. Uh, some it has been mixed up here. So I will uh, will tell you here. You have the first line here, which is the upper line. It's the cognitive decline in people with hearing loss treated with hearing aids. The middle line here is cognitive decline in people without hearing loss, and the lower line here is cognitive decline in people with hearing loss not treated with hearing aids. So what this actually tells us is, is that you can see here that already in the beginning that, they are, that the, the people who have uh, hearing loss and treated with hearing aids, they have a better cognitive state 
also compared to those without a hearing loss, and even better than those who have a hearing, uh, hearing known hearing loss, but not a hearing aid. And this actually seems to, uh, uh, the distance between the curves seems to be quite equal all over the 25 years. So if hearing aids really should have helped uh, those people here, you would have expect a, a much wider distance between the lines over, over over time. So what could what 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 will this tell us anything about? Is this could be that the people that actually seek help for hearing loss and be, be treated with hearing aids that they are very different. Uh, maybe they are more social engaging. Maybe they, uh, 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 they 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 think more about health, and there could be a lot of other factors that actually place them on on on, on the on the upper line here. So the study does not really. Does not really show that hearing aid is actually benef beneficiary. It just shows that those who are using hearing aids, they actually may, may be different from those who, who don't use it. So this is, of course, very important uh, to know this. And uh, the study that Manuela told about, uh, we, uh, we we have uh, done a lot to to control for for, for factors that actually could uh, could explain some of those uh, differences here. Many other studies have, have been done. I'll just go very briefly over these. This is a, this is a, a small study on, 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 on patients who are going to have cochlear implants, and they could also show by using these uh, different uh, cognitive tests here uh, that they actually uh, improved in doing those tests after cochlear, cochlear implantation. And uh, some of the critics for, for these kind of studies tell, they, uh, say, also say, uh, say that the yeah, well, well, uh, is this just because they couldn't hear anything? So, so they, if you can't hear, then you probably also have difficulties understanding what to do in this cognitive test. And this is, of course, a very relevant concern when you are doing tests on severely hearing impaired, uh, impaired people, uh, people here. Ne nevertheless, they, they could show an, an improvement uh, after cochlear implantation. There's another study here recently published last year, also from uh, from from Belgium, where they actually have tried. Uh, also using a, a cochlear implant candidates uh, to uh, uh, to see whether they actually improved in cognition after cochlear implantation and they could uh, somehow uh, show this uh, uh, in most of the, the patients that actually improved and they did a lot actually to uh, to to screen them uh, for for cognition uh, uh, using methodologies that did not require uh, their, their sense of hearing. So they, they try to use other measures, visual uh, measures and, and, and so on. So, so of course, this is the way uh, forward uh, uh, trying to, 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 to prove this. And lastly, I would mention this uh, achieved study, which has been, uh, uh, there's a lot, uh, uh, there has been a lot uh, in the media about uh, this study as, as well. And uh, this was basically done as a randomized controlled trial where they where, where they uh, where they uh, 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 where, where they actually make the, a, a draw between the hearing aid treatment and uh, and, and, and and counseling. So so this uh, this was just more like a health education that the, the control group got. And then they followed these patients for for three years. They're not looking at dementia as such. They're looking at cognitive decline. Uh, what they found was that in, in the group of, uh, of, 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 uh, of patients here with hearing loss, they did not find an effect of hearing aids. However, they had a subgroup here, a group with, uh, with people with arthrosclerotic risk factors. So these are actually patients who have other, other kinds of, of problems, for instance, uh, uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes, and, and so on. And if you look specifically in this group, they could actually find an, an, an improvement by using the, the hearing aids. So there were less cognitive decline in, in this group uh, compared, uh, compared to, uh, uh, to those who did not uh, use, use hearing aids. So what does this, this tell us? This could tell us something about if your brain is somehow uh, affected by other diseases, uh, then uh, your brain uh, function, your, maybe your cognitive capacity will be lowered because of this. And this is the reason why uh, you, you, you probably uh, could see a benefit here uh, for, 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 for the hearing aids. So I've, I've tried to play a little bit with, uh, with these uh, mechanisms here. And, uh, and uh, I've uh, illustrated this here with uh, this uh, a simple uh, a glass of uh, water here. You can see when it is completely in empty, that means you have a large uh, cognitive uh, cognitive capacity. 
if you are, for instance, uh, affected by uh, sleep deprivation, that could uh, uh, eat up some of your cognitive uh, capacity because you're more tired during the day. Cardiovascular risk factors also can eat up some of your cognitive uh, capacity because uh, the blood flow to your brain would be affected and your brain is not functioning as good as it should. Hearing loss will also take up some of your cognitive capacity for some of the mechanisms that I explained in the beginning. So it actually requires more uh, it, it requires more uh, uh, more, more uh, cognitive uh, capacity and problem solving, understanding uh, what's going on. Uh, if you are also have to 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 guess uh, some of uh, the words that you ha you haven't uh, you haven't heard. So uh, if you use the hearing aids, then you could uh, think about okay, can it actually give me some of this. Uh, uh, cognitive capacity to back uh, because uh, if you, we can alleviate the hearing loss somehow, then it could uh, possibly uh, lead to uh, to to increase the uh, increased co cognitive capacity, and we're not getting into the state here where we actually can talk uh, about dementia. So this may be one of the reasons why uh, we actually show that hearing aids also seems to work in this group where they have these uh, cardiovascular risk factors. So I think I will end by end, end here, and um, and then uh, yeah uh, we can uh, discuss this uh, of course <laughs> if if you have some inputs uh, to 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 this in the audience and then uh, we'll pass the word to to Søren. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jesper, and uh, please leave your questions in the Q and A if you have any for Jesper, Manuela, and uh, Søren as well. <laughs> Uh, that was very interesting, and um, yeah, I'll leave the, the word to you, sir. Yeah, so I, oops, I'm trying to share here just a So can you see my screen? Yes, that's, that looks okay. perfect. So I have a little bit of a weird setup here, but I'll, I'll try and, and, and make it work then. So yeah, thank you for uh, for having me. and, and um, and uh, and uh, thank you to the audience. It's it's difficult because you, uh, we can't see you, <laughs> but I imagine you as a as a very uh, a nice crowd uh, uh, for this uh, for this uh, session here. So I'll I'll take a slightly different perspective uh, uh, going in from the cochlear implant side. I mean, Jesper was just mentioning uh, cochlear implants um, uh, in some of the studies, and and I just want to give some perspectives first on what is a cochlear implant and what does it mean to listen with a cochlear implant. Because that is quite different uh, compared to actually listening with a hearing aid. Uh, um, most of us know a hearing aid as something that amplifies the sound, whereas a cochlear implant is quite different. And then I'll go in and look a little bit on the the, uh, the more cognitive aspects of, of listening with a with a cochlear implant, and zoom a little bit in on some of the studies on on dementia or cognitive decline uh, in the cochlear implant space. Uh, some some overlap to what Jesper has been uh, talking about and, and Manuela. Uh, and then finally, I will I will try and look a little bit at what what is the industry actually doing uh, to to kind of make solutions that address uh, the cognitive aspects of, of hearing uh, more than uh, than we have done uh, probably in the past. So let me see if I can change the slides here. Uh, yeah, uh, I hope it works for you. Um, so um, so basically, uh, just listing here some 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 numbers. I don't want to go through the details, but there's a lot of people out there with a the need for for hearing treatments. Uh, WHO estimates that that there is more than 460 million people in the world in need of of um, of, of some sort some sort of treatment. Uh, but zooming in a little bit on the cochlear implant, so these are the patients where they have a really severe, profound, severe hearing loss. So they have a very hard time hearing. Uh, some of them are completely deaf. So they can't they can't do with a a, a a normal acoustic amplification. They will need something different, uh, and and uh, this is probably in the range of five to ten percent of of the population of of these uh, hearing uh, people with hearing disabilities that could benefit from a cochlear implant. Uh, many of them may be getting a superpower hearing aid or very powerful hearing aid, where they may actually in fact be better off with a, a cochlear implant. Uh, but but uh, so, so this is kind of the numbers. Uh, but when you look at the developed world, so where access to cochlear implant care is is there, and where you can have funding for cochlear implants, it's probably less than five percent uh, penetration in in in, in these uh, regions. So and if you include the develop uh, the developing world, it's even worse, right? Because access to care, uh, cochlear implant care, is not there. Uh, the cost of these devices is, of course, a lot, a lot higher than a hearing aid because it is also involving a lot of surgery and stuff like that. 
So um, just a few words on how a cochlear implant works, because there may be some people in the audience that, that do not know uh, much about cochlear implants. But basically, a cochlear implant is uh, electric hearing. So the, the basic idea here is that you implant uh, a number of electrodes inside the cochlea uh, on the surgery. Uh, so typically around 20 contacts. And then you basically uh, convert the acoustic sound into some sort of map that you can then uh, push to the electrodes as in the form of electric stimulation. So you're basically stimulating the auditory nerve electrically uh, and and uh, each electrode corresponds to a specific frequency region that you're trying to uh, to stimulate. Of course, when you do this inside the cochlea, you have a fluid. So, you know, you an electric current, they tends to spread in, in, uh, in fluids, uh, in conductive fluids. So it doesn't really make sense to stimulate all electrodes at once. So typically you stimulate only a few or only one electrode at a time, and you only stimulate a, sub, a, a small subset of electrodes, typically eight electrodes per, per time frame. Uh, so the resolution is quite, uh, is quite coarse when you're listening with a cochlear implant. So it's a completely different type of sound that, uh, that patients are getting. Um, so uh, getting a cochlear implant, uh, even though we know that it has uh, really, really uh, great benefits to people that have a, a profound or severe hearing loss, uh, is still something that uh, is, is, uh, is an obstacle race. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lack of awareness. So in, in the clinics, in the general population, there's a lack of awareness of, of this kind of treatment. Uh, so the limits on access, it's not everywhere. I mean, in Denmark, we have uh, three clinics that does uh, cochlear implants. Uh, one of them is with uh, Jesper in, uh, in Odense. Um, and, uh, and so the access is, is more limited than uh, access to hearing aid. And of course, there's a fear of surgery because getting this involves a surgery where you have to have an implant. Uh, there's also a fear of, of, redu of, of, of losing any residual acoustic hearing you have because when you put something into the cochlea, there's a high risk that you basically induce a trauma that uh, gives you uh, uh, where, where you lose the, the rest of the hearing you have, basically. And then there's another part which there's a, a very high variance on the outcome. So typically you have some a good average performance uh, among all users, but you have some really heavy tails on the distribution. And I'll show you some data on that. Uh, and then, of course, the complexity of the aftercare is another thing because it, you, as you can imagine, uh, getting a cochlear implant is not like just getting amplified sound. It's actually a new way of, of learning to hear. So there's a lot more rehabilitation involved to train yourself to listen to that uh, kind of sound. So, so it, and in particular, the variable outcomes and the complexity of aftercare has, has a lot of links to, uh, to what I would call cognitive fitness or, or you know, uh, how fit are you cognitively to actually uh, train yourself and, and, and use a, a, a cochlear implant uh, and get a good result out of that. Uh, and it's very different depending on what's, what uh, period of your life uh, you're in, if it's a young person or an old person, of course, as well. Uh, this slide here is just a picture uh, briefly showing, I mean, for, for the signal processing guys in the audience, uh, basically uh, you're mapping the sound into uh, uh, channels and then you stimulate electrically on the channel uh, with a level which corresponds to more or less the amplitude in that channel. Um, and uh, um, when you look at acoustic hearing, which is, is kind of like this top plot on the, uh, on the, uh, on the right side of the slide here, uh, you have a very high resolution. So this is just a schematic representation. So it's a, a frequency representation of speech. Whereas in a cochlear implant, you get a very kind of coarse reputation. You're only stimulating on a discrete number of electrodes. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, it, it looks like a very pixelized uh, picture, uh, and it is. So if you just put a little bit of noise into this, it's going to be extremely difficult for CI patients to actually hear anything. So where hearing aid users, they are able to operate in, 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 in somewhat noisy situations. Uh, cochlear implant users, they can't cope with noise in most cases. So they're really struggling when you have noise. So it actually gives them a lot of, uh, they have to use a lot of effort uh, to, to actually understand and, and follow conversations in more noisy conditions. Uh, so, so the, the, um, the outcomes I, made, uh, I mentioned about these uh, distributions with heavy tails, what we typically see with cochlear implant patients is that we have uh, some patients that are really star performers. They have really good performance, sometimes even performance that we can't explain because they're getting really limited sound. So the brain is somehow able to make sense of a really uh, coarse sound picture. Uh, but we also sometimes uh, or, or always in, in studies like this one see a, a group of poor performers where they never really become good, uh, even though uh, they get trained and they have rehabilitation and so on. And then there's a very good large pool of people that have a good average. And, and there's kind of like many factors that affect the outcome uh, for CI patients. Uh, so the duration of deafness, nerve survival in the cochlea, of course, uh, 
surgical access, uh, you know, uh, or success, sorry, uh, and also the aftercare and all that. But one factor that's also affecting the outcome is the cognitive fitness. I mean, how 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 fit are you for actually doing the rehabilitation? Uh, how how much can you actually take uh, and, and and go to the rehabilitation and absorb in terms of, of, of training yourself? Uh, so so that also affects uh, the the uh, the outcome, of course. So really, uh, zooming a little bit in on the more cognitive aspects, so really listening with the cochlear implant is something that uh, requires uh, substantial rehabilitation. Typically, patients, they have to go to speech training and speech pathology for, for quite some time, and they uh, they will typically require several fine tunings along the way. Uh, uh, so it takes typically a lot of uh, effort to listen with the cochlear implant and also a lot of plasticity changes to the brain. So the brain needs to really learn and adapt to, to this uh, new kind of, of sound. And it's really different depending on whether you're prelingually deaf. So, I mean, if, if you're an infant born with uh, without hearing, uh, how you develop and how you cope with using cochlear implant sound is quite different from what you would uh, see in, in a postlingual deaf user that has had language before and has, has acoustic templates of how sound is uh, in the brain, you can say, uh, when they get a cochlear implant. So, uh, so really uh, a lot of uh, uh, cognitive aspects of, of hearing. Um, so I just want to show this one, which is uh, known as the uh, the, uh, uh, the hearing connectome. I mean, so so the brain, hearing in the brain, as Jesper has also alluded to, and Manuela, is not an isolated function. It's really uh, drawing a lot of resources in different parts of the brain. So you're using uh, working memory, uh, language communication centers, attention, and so on. So there's a lot lot uh, of of uh, brain areas that are involved in hearing. Uh, and, and the thing is that when uh, the uh, when the, the hearing is impaired, uh, the listening connectome is more intensely engaged. So you need to use more parts of the brain for actually processing what uh, is being said. So processing this, the speech, you need to use your working memory more. You need to try and, and, and figure out what are the holes in the sound or the speech you're getting. What, what, what do I need to fill in to understand that sentence? Uh, and that, of course, is, is, uh, is inducing some sort of listening effort that you have to spend more cognitive energy actually listening to uh, to an, and following a conversation. Um, another part here, which is, is particularly interesting for, for cochlear implants is uh, how the human brain develops is in particularly in, in terms of uh, the sensory pathway, so vision and hearing. Uh, and what you typically uh, would see is that the, or what you would see is that, that uh, the sensory pathways like vision and hearing is actually developing a lot during the, the first year after birth, right? So if you have a child that is born deaf it is kind of critical uh, that uh, this child gets uh, the proper hearing treatment. It could be a hearing aid if that is what is relevant, but also a cochlear implant. And we are typically talking about a critical period for cochlear implant for infants. And that's why you would see uh, babies that are born deaf, they are typically offered cochlear implantation very early on in their life. Uh, I think in Denmark, it's probably like six or nine months typically uh, where we actually implant uh, babies uh, to get hearing. And that is to help them on their development of their auditory uh, system. Uh, the risk, of course, if you do not, if you get your cochlear implant late uh, uh, as a child, uh, there is a risk that other parts of the brain will start taking over the auditory cortex. So the visual processing will, I mean, visual uh, processing will start happening in the auditory cost, uh, cortex. So you see this kind of cross-modal uh, uh, reorganization of the brain. Um, so, so definitely also some important aspects of uh, cognition here and, and the developing brain, you can say. Jesper also alluded uh, and, and Manuela alluded to, to this uh, neuroanatomical uh, evidence. So there is kind of like a, a more and more evidence coming out there that also from brain imaging showing that, uh, you know, something's happening to the brain when you have a hearing loss. Uh, there's been studies showing that even early uh, mild to moderate hearing loss can induce some sort of uh, changes in the brain, indicating audio-visual crossover uh, or reorganization. Um, also a faster decline of, of, of the whole brain. So in terms of volume of the brain, there's been some studies indicating that as, as, as an effect of, of hearing impairment. And uh, also indications that it's not only the auditory cortex, cortex but also higher uh, cogn cognition and multisensory integration, a lot of areas that are really affected by, by hearing loss. So there is, you know, more and more evidence uh, establishing the link between uh, cognitive aspects, the brain development and, uh, and, and hearing, of course. Um, 
So when when I, you know when you look at uh, like like Jesper and Manuel has been studying uh, uh, dementia and cognitive decline and, and hearing uh, when you when you zoom in on the CI population, uh, so I, I try to take a look at the different uh, different literature that has been published recently in this in this space and there is quite a number of studies but um, and they all may indicate some sort of cognitive improvement in some domains typically in some domains so not a general kind of like cognitive improvement but in some subdomains uh, of cognition uh, at best uh, but they're always challenged by this fact that uh, there is a a, a small sub population size a small cohort uh, because there's not a lot of ci patients available so if you want to do a study on ci uh, you typically have limited access to to uh, the number of patients you need to do a good study in particular in your own geography i mean uh, in denmark we implant i think it's about 300 uh, patients a year with a cochlear implant so you can imagine that it's a fairly small population you have to work with. Uh, and especially if you want to do dementia studies and studies in, in cognition and with the elderly population, that's that's even more limited uh, as well. And, and what I at least find when I look in, in those studies is that uh, most of them are not very conclusive uh, on cogn cognitive impairment or dementia related to, uh, to hearing loss or patients wearing a cochlear implant. Uh, most of the studies, they tend to, rec uh, to recommend larger long longitudinal studies to be undertaken. So that's always one of the last sentences in, in the conclusion or in the abstract. And some of them, they hypothesize that there's a potential cognitive benefit of cochlear implants, but it's, it's not really well substantiated or documented yet, I think. Um, but what they all tend to show uh, is that, they, uh, that you have a consistent uh, quality of life improvement and that uh, a very substantial speech uh, uh, understanding uh, improvement. So most of these patients that get a cochlear implant, they can can live a, a life which is is like their normal hearing peers. They can go to schools and do studies and have jobs and so on. So it, it really reduces all those risk factors that we that we know that uh, are risk factors for dementia, like uh, isolation and, and depression and these kind of social isolation things. Um, so, so, so in, in that sense, you can say uh, the treatment is, is, is very successful on, on that parameter, but it yet has to be shown, I think, uh, in larger studies, uh, whether it actually can uh, affect uh, or reduce the risk of, of uh, developing uh, dementia or cognitive decline. So I just listed a few studies here, and I'm not going to go into too very much detail with them, but what, what you can basically see is that the sample size of the cohort uh, in the, these studies are typically somewhere around 70 to 100 patients, so it's a fairly small population. Uh, typically, the follow-up is a few years, somewhere between one and five, seven years. Uh, and as you can see, this was the study that, that Jesper mentioned, the study by Monnier, uh, for the French uh, study, where uh, they followed uh, about 70 patients and uh, a seven-year follow-up, and where they could basically see that in a group of patients that had mild cognitive impair impairment uh, before they got surgery with a CI, uh, actually, 30, about 30% 30 of them actually improved on their cognition and, and became close to their normal peers, normal hearing peers. Um, whereas uh, patients uh, without cognitive impairment uh, pre-op, actually about 30% of them developed cognitive impairment uh, over the seven-year period, uh, probably as part of their aging. Um, and and uh, so you can, this is very uh, kind of like uh, uh, much the same you see for, for the other studies. Typically, they show that there are certain domains where you have improvements in, in cognitive uh, uh, performance, like recall, delayed recall, uh, executive function, verbal memory, stuff like that. Um, the only study I, I have found, more recent study, which is a study from, uh, from Melbourne, University of Melbourne, it's called the Enhanced Study. It's a larger study, but when they start focusing and zooming in on the CI population of their cohort, uh, they're doing a long-term follow-up. So right now, they are at 5.5-year follow-up. And what they have basically uh, indicated is that they have a, a really uh, strong uh, improvement in, in, uh, in some subdomains like working memory and executive function over time and where other domains are stable uh, also compared to the, uh, to the uh, normal hearing population. So there are some indications, but the, the data is still not, uh, as I see it, very strong, uh, only just uh, indications at this stage. Um, so, so the question then for CI manufacturers or hearing uh, hearing device manufacturers in, in, in general is, uh, you know, uh, what can we do beyond uh, raw speech scores? I mean, we have historically been focusing a lot on, on improving and developing hearing solutions that gives good speech uh, understanding. 
but really for, for cochlear implants, I found this picture, uh, which was from the cochlear implant day uh, in 2017. So what you would, would see when you talk to a cochlear implant patient, uh, they would very often say, well, after a long day of hearing, they, they like to take their implants off because it's been really, really hard. Uh, it's a lot of effort. They're very tired. So this uh, nice monkey sitting in a, in a bath is, is a good indication of uh, what it feels like taking off your cochlear implants. So, so for me and, and for many in, in, the, in the industry, it is really about how can we help the users uh, cope with this? Uh, how can we help the users reduce their effort uh, in listening? Uh, and how can we in particular use, uh, help the users actually stay, uh, stay online with their implants uh, during the day? Because we don't want them to be socially isolated. So how can we make them uh, use their device all day? And then another question could be, you know, is listening with a uh, cochlear implant, is that really brain fitness? A little bit back to Jesper's uh, uh, comment on whether listening effort could actually uh, stress the brain uh, in a way so that it actually uh, develops, uh, you know, uh, cognitive decline. Uh, so we don't really know. Uh, studies could indicate both. Uh, but but um, so so is listening with the cochlear implant, is that brain fitness or is just is, is the high effort that you need to listen? Is this that just a condition uh, you have uh, using these kinds of devices? Uh, yeah, uh, and, and as I mentioned, I think the, the, you know, also thinking a lot about how can you, how can you adapt your solutions? How can you adapt uh, your devices and your aftercare and so on to different uh, uh, periods of, of life? Uh, so when you're a child, I mean, typically when you have children, you use this kind of like mothery speech or this kind of like very intonated speech to talk to a child. Uh, cochlear implants are not very good at conveying that kind of information. Um, then you have the school, the learning, uh, where there's noise. How do you cope with that? Uh, in, in the early adulthood, you want to listen to music and social life is very much about going out with your friends and noisy conditions, music and so on. Cochlear implants uh, users are really struggling there. And then in late life where your cognitive power, CPU power may be a little bit reduced, how can you actually help uh, elderly patients getting a cochlear implant uh, to to do the right rehabilitation and 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 uh, have the right uh, uh, outcomes with their devices? So those are some of the questions uh, that you can ask. Um, so then, then I reflected a little bit on what is the what is the hearing device industry really doing in this field? I think uh, you know, and and actually there is a lot of things going on, um, and and I think. Uh, it, it's fair to say that Oticon, uh, Oticon has been one of the first movers on brain hearing. Now I'm not with Oticon anymore. I can say that I have been with Oticon, <laughs> but but uh, Oticon has been been studying uh, cognitive aspects of hearing uh, since the 90s, uh, so for quite a long time. Uh, but all the manufacturers are now putting a lot of focus and interest on what is the link between cognition and hearing, and how do these things interact. Um, so so that's definitely something that has uh, has catched on. Um, also, the industry uh, is putting uh, massive funding uh, towards research in hearing and dementia uh, in recent years. So, uh, so, so that's also across the industry that that we're we're, we're sending money that way to understand this uh, potential causal link or not causal link between uh, dementia and hearing. Also, uh, the industry has been uh, working more and more on new assessment paradigms, uh, which try to look at. Uh, cognitive aspects beyond just speech scores. So uh, the listening efforts, uh, attention, so measuring what sounds are you attending to. You can do that by looking at the ET signals and cor correlating the ET signals to the sounds that you're listening to. You can actually you can actually see the sound that you're attending to in the brain signal. Uh, and also, of course, looking more and more towards uh, quality of life improvements and ecological momentary assessments, because we are starting to to acknowledge that people, they don't live in anechoic chambers. They actually live in the real world. So the testing needs to be done also in the real world. Uh, and and uh, so that's also a, a, a big movement uh, across the industry and, and across research, of course. One thing I find uh, particularly interesting also in, in this whole cognitive aspect of hearing is this uh, focus on intent-driven uh, processing. So really trying to understand what is it the user would like to uh, hear and see or experience in that particular situation. So trying to decode uh, what is the user attending to, what sounds are the user attending to. And you can do that by using brain signals like EG signals. You can use that, uh, do that by listening, you know, uh, maybe using accelerometers to, uh, to understand where the patient is uh, turning the head or how much uh, head movements they have. 
but also simple things like trying to, to understand the dialogue or the turn taking. So using own voice detectors to understand how is the patient or the, the user engaging with other people in the environment, because that can be an indication of what they are intending to do or what they want to listen to. Uh, another thing, uh, a little bit of a hobby horse of mine is multimodal integration. I think uh, we know the brain is super plastic, so you can actually also sometimes get benefits of adding modalities uh, to users that have hard uh, time uh, uh, understanding speech in, in noise, for example, so tactile information. There's some research going on in this area as well, uh, potentially also using tactile stimulation as an, a, a modality to help rehabilitation, uh, help you attend to certain sounds in the environment. Uh, during your early stages of, of, of CI listening. And then, of course, focus beyond speech because, you know, the um, the world is so much more than speech. Uh, so music and other sounds is also super important uh, to, to keep a focus on because it's also very much music is such a social thing. Uh, it's something you engage a lot with your with your friends and your families uh, to do uh, to listen to. So excluding part of the population. So cochlear implant users have a hard time listening to music uh, and many uh, patients with a hearing aid, especially if it's a, a, a superpower hearing aid or very powerful hearing aid, they also have uh, less enjoyment from music compared to their normal hearing peers. So I think this is some of the things that are moving uh, in, in the industry uh, um, uh, right now on, on, you know, building on the cognitive uh, and, uh, uh, aspects of hearing and the knowledge around cognition and hearing. So I think that's that's what I wanted to uh, to push. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Sean. Uh, now um, we have uh, time for a quick Q&A session here. Unfortunately, I had two questions in the Q&A box, but they disappeared. Please, can you uh, repeat the questions, the two of you who who uh, did ask questions and uh, for those of you uh, who, who are still there, please uh, please ask your questions uh, in the Q&A. I will uh, start the party here with um, uh, just a few uh, general questions here. Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, Sean, you, uh, you were mentioning that the data is not yet that strong. And uh, as as you all uh, kind of uh, uh, mentioned, uh, so what would the next? And it seems like we're not done with the research here on, on dementia. So what would the next step in dementia research be? Yeah, I think I think it's it's very much like uh, what Jesper and Manuela has already alluded to. I mean, we, we need larger studies. We need studies with larger cohorts. We need studies that are more longitudinal. Uh, it is we need to study across time. Um, uh, so I think the kind of work that uh, that Manuela and Jesper has been doing is is what you know what we can do, and also in particular in Denmark we have this fantastic opportunity with the uh, CPR uh, register, which gives us a, a unique uh, possibility to do those kinds of studies. Uh, and I think in the cochlear implant world, I mean, if if, if I zoom a little bit into the cochlear, I'm, I'm very focused on this domain, of course, because I'm working in this domain, but but. Also because uh, we know that cochlear implant listening is so is so stressful or so so effortful uh, for patients, right? So so uh, it, it it could be really interesting to study that group a little bit more. But the, the challenge we have there is that we have very few patients in in our ge geography, right? So really, if you want to do a good study here, you probably need to go uh, international, right? So you really need to do multinational uh, longitudinal uh, uh, studies, uh, and that is unfortunately super expensive and <laughs> uh, very hard to get the, the right level of funding for so that that's more like uh, that's more like eu projects or something like that where you really get uh, massive funding long term to do this right do you have anything to add there manuela um is that a, anything that you might be looking into or is it like Sean said maybe something a bit bigger yeah i i think actually what Sean says he i think he summarized pretty well uh, I, I also see that like you need to use different uh, geographical contexts and one of the as I as I talked before that we find uh, lower risk estimates here in Denmark might also be one of the reasons might also be that uh, here is one of the countries where treating hearing loss is taken seriously compared to other countries so that's why it's definitely extremely important I think to do 
uh, yeah, to do a study that could be inclusive with uh, yeah different geographical contexts. So yeah, Perfect. I I think it was very good what he said. <laughs> Thank you, Manuela. Okay, I have a question here from Claire Richards in the audience. Does the frequency of social interaction also impact hearing loss? In other words, can time spent actively listening to others strengthen our hearing or delay hearing loss? She's asking because um, she's heard of a lot of people talk about hesitancy to begin hearing treatment because they fear using it as a crutch will weaken their listening skills and worsen their hearing. Maybe Jesper, do you, do you want to yeah, I can, uh, answer? I can, I can try. Uh, well, uh, you you can't you can't really uh, 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 train train your hearing in a way so that you can uh, avoid uh, hearing loss because this is something uh, some other processes uh, going on there. Uh, of of course you can uh, you can train your listening uh, your listening skills your listening abilities so so that you you probably can train uh, to be, be to be a better listener for instance in uh, in surroundings with, uh, with 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 background noise but but you cannot. Uh, you cannot uh, train your your hearing in a way so that you actually can uh, can protect uh, protect the, the hearing the hearing loss. So so, so I think uh, the the most important uh, part of this is actually to to try to motivate uh, people who actually have a hearing loss to start a hearing aid treatment uh, early on if if there's of course is a clear indication for 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 that. Uh, and and the reason for this is that that you also need to be cognitive fit. Uh, when you start uh, uh, taking up your your, your hearing aids, we we see many examples also in the clinics. If 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 you come very very late, then it becomes hard to learn start using hearing aids, and the same goes also for instance for the cochlear implants. So and so if you're not if you're not cognitive fit enough uh, for 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 getting into the into the process, then it may also be difficult for you start 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 you, you using it. So so I I, I think. Uh, I think this should not. Uh, this, I think this is a, a, a misunderstanding. If 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 this is something that exists, that that they, they if they they fear using hearing aids, if they fear that they will lose hearing hearing skills, it's probably uh, it, it's probably not a, a very good idea to uh, to go along that way. I think. Do you agree, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, but not only from uh, from. Uh, I'm not selling hearing aids anymore, so I, I, you know, I'm selling cochlear implants. So that's a harder thing to convince people to take. But, but definitely, of of course. I mean, the uh, hearing loss is 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 a, a a physiological thing happening with your 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 auditory system on your your hair cells in the cochlea and so on. And you can't you can't prevent that from of of course. You can induce more hearing loss yourself by going to uh, loud concerts and listening to loud noises and, uh, and loud sounds and so on. But but uh, conversations is definitely not harmful uh, for your hearing. Um, All right. Thank you, Sam. Now I have a question uh, for Jesper and Manuela. This is from Sergi Griful. Um, do you have any measure in the Southern Denmark study that could reflect quality of the hearing intervention? For example, how many batteries requests by individual as hearing aid users proxy? How frequently they get a new hearing aid? If so, have you investigated how this potential quality of intervention metric relates to dementia risk? Yes, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, and yeah, it's something we have discussed, um, yeah quite a lot actually after the paper has been published uh, but I the problem we have here with the data that we used is that it doesn't cover a very large time span uh, so yeah I, I didn't go into details in the presentation but it's uh, like the database that we get data on hearing aid use and subsidy and so on it starts from like after the beginning of our follow-up considerably later uh, after the beginning of our follow-up. So we don't have enough data to do, uh, to develop this kind of markers yet, but it's, it is within our, yeah, uh, within the, in the pipeline for future studies, we, we talk about doing that, but we unfortunately cannot give you anything at this moment. I don't know if Jesper wants to add. Anything. Yeah, I can. I can add uh, add a bit. Uh, we 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 did we did uh, uh, 
as Manuel said, we did have access to 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 this uh, battery uh, battery consumption. There was a da database there, but of course, it was only within a limited uh, a time frame. So I think it was from, I think maybe from uh, 2010 and even later, where we had the first uh, autograms uh, dating back to uh, 1998. Uh, so 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 it was uh, there was a lot of uh, of, of Places that where we did not uh, know anything about how many batteries they have actually used. However, we did use we did use these uh, these data somehow to to, to make a, a, a convincing argument that the patients that we or that we know have had have have a hearing loss and also have got a hearing aid that there were some indications of that they actually also uh, have used the hearing aids. But one thing is to get a hearing aid. The other thing the other thing is to use it. So of course, uh, of course, this is important uh, to know if uh, using hearing aids will uh, will alleviate uh, the risk uh, for, uh, for 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 dementia. Uh, so so this was one way, and and we 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 had this. Uh, the other database was about um, uh, when when you get because in Denmark, uh, and this is some of the, the 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 strong parts of our system here is that we have a a large. Uh, Part of, of hearing aid uh, treatment is is, is public uh, public funded. So we all also know when people receive a, a a subsidy for 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 the hearing aid. So this mean this means that typically after four years you can get a new hearing aid. So having a hearing aid and asking for a subsidy four years later is probably also a good indication of that that some of these people are actually using uh, are using these these hearing aids. So these are some of the measures that. That we actually have, but maybe if we do the same study in ten years' time, and so if we have a, a far more data on this, then it could probably be uh, be something that we could uh, could dig more into. Thank you, yes, but I don't know if you have anything to add, uh, Søren. You look like someone who. No, oh, yeah, well, I was just, I was just uh, reflecting on what what Jesper mentioned on this. Uh, the, the the you know one thing is having a hearing aid. The other thing is how much you use it. And of course, I think it's a, it's a very good indication if they if they renew their hearing aid uh, uh, after four years, uh, a new a new uh, reimbursement of a hearing aid. Of course, that's probably an indication. Uh, but but even even that, you know, it's it's very often when when you meet patients in in, in clinics and and you ask as an audiologist, you ask them, okay, how much did you use your hearing aid? They will, will sometimes uh, give you. Uh, 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 more higher numbers than is actually the case. So, so many manufacturers they have these data locking systems built into the hearing aid, so you can actually read out how many hours have you been using your device every day. And typically, the the hours that you read out are, are lower than what the patients report. Uh, so there is also a, a an important um, push on trying to have patients both with cochlear implants and hearing aids use their device uh, throughout the, the day, right? Uh, and and but but sometimes it's this thing about uh, effort, you know, uh, for the cochlear implant users. If they get really tired after a long hearing day and take their hearing device off just to relax, right? So so that 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 is a problem um, for sure. All right, thank you, all of you. I have a question here from Alistair Moore, who is uh, appreciative of uh, getting access to all this data. It was clearly very valuable. So. Thank you for that. Uh, were there any challenges getting the permissions in place, and how would you recommend others to go about setting up similar studies? Um, yes, there were quite a lot of challenges, especially I would say, especially in relation to the to the hearing aids uh, related database. Um, and yeah, it actually yeah it took few years for one of them. Because uh, yeah, it was really hard to know who actually controlled the database. But I think if it's a if it's a study in Denmark, uh, and we have the advantage that the the national registries, for instance, and statistics Denmark is something that the process is pretty much established. And uh, but if it's someone trying to do this a study here, then uh, yeah, you, you are very welcome to get in contact, and then I can let you know. The, the people that we have talked to and so on. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, so um, I feel like I need to mention that uh, um, mm -hmm. there was a, a colleague of mine who's, who said that there was recently a study on dementia that was retracted. And um, there might be some in the audience uh, who might be wondering uh, why and what happened? Uh, 
can any of you uh, do any of you dare to touch a bit on that? Yeah, because I can say a little, little, little bit uh, uh, about it. I think it was uh, it, it was a study done on some uh, UK uh, U, on some UK biobank uh, data where they actually have uh, have, have analyzed uh, analyzed this uh, this link uh, basically like like we, we we do. But but I I think that there were some some others trying to redo their analysis and then and they figured out along the way that they have switched around uh, some some variables so that they uh, uh, so that their findings were not uh, were not really uh, valid and uh, that's uh, i think that was why it, it was uh, it was retracted but it it, it was uh, uh, out there in the uh, in, in the open area for about a, a half a year or so before this was actually we, we were tracked this, uh, this study. All right, thank you very much, Jesper. So we are about to wrap up here. Uh, we'll uh, the, the finish uh, our session here. I'd just like to ask you a bit about this uh, sound awareness that it seems like uh, all of you kind of touched on. Um, so, so what do you see as the main issue to people not getting uh, hearing aids in time? Uh, is it is it hearing awareness in society, or is it something in the industry that could kind of be optimized for to help people better? Yeah, I, I can I can say a little bit from from my perspective here. It's it's uh, I think I, I think it's just a lot. It's a, have of course a lot to do about uh, uh, motivating people to to get started. Uh, at, at the at the right time, people tend to uh, to postpone this. Uh, they may have noticed that they have had hearing problems for, for quite a while before actually uh, seeking uh, seeking help help for this. So I think I think there is a uh, I think this is something that probably should should, should have some awareness in in uh, in, in the society if, if we should maybe. Uh, motivate people to 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 start this uh, at an early time. I think this will uh, will will benefit uh, uh, benefit the patients also because they, as I said before, the uh, the the degree of hearing aid uptake would probably also be larger if uh, you have a, a greater cognitive, uh, cognitive capacity when you actually start using uh, uh, using the hearing aid. So I, I think this would be probably be the the way we should go forward. Uh, if we should change something here. Hmm. So, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think that the, the, the best the industry can do is to support, uh, you know, research uh, in this area, basically, because of course, I mean, in the, if the industry starts pushing certain agendas and so on, it's not objective anymore, right? So I think we need to, we need to help each other push uh, funding for this kind of research uh, to document these effects. And the Danish uh, hearing aid industry has been uh, really good at this, I think, uh, throughout uh, decades uh, at, at actually helping the research community uh, um, understand these links and and also uh, understand, you know, how can we how can we uh, expand uh, access to hearing care? Uh, how can we increase awareness? Um, so I think it has to go. It, it is it is somehow an academic industrial collaboration, but it needs to be set up in a way where it's uh, it's objective and not driven by individual company agendas. When we are talking about these kinds of big uh, big agendas like dementia and hearing, it is important that it's it's done in a proper way. I think. Um, well, what a beautiful way to end here, and I hope that we have helped just push a little bit uh, to the agenda and uh, uh, about hearing and dementia. I. Uh, definitely want to say thank you to all three of you for uh, for joining us uh, today. Jesper Vest Smith, Manuela Cantuaria, and Søren Ries. I'm sure that they're happy to ask uh, any uh, further questions you have if you reach them uh, where they are available. Um, now, this was a webinar brought to you by Danish Sound Cluster. Please go follow us on YouTube and LinkedIn. And uh, check out our website for um, new uh, and uh, upcoming events. And there's lots of uh, new uh, things going on. Don't forget uh, Danish Sound Day, 5th of November. Um, so if you want to collaborate, if you have an idea for a new research, a new product or something uh, similar, 
please uh, reach out to us because uh, we facilitate a lot of collaborative projects and uh, you can reach out to our project manager, Tina Midgold, and she will be delighted to hear from you. And that's all for now. Uh, see you some other time, hopefully. And uh, thank you all for participating and see you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks for the invite. Bye-bye.